I don't believe the Bible. It was just written by man. I don't believe the Bible. It's full of contradictions. I don't believe the Bible. I believe in science. Maybe you've brought up a scripture at your workplace and you've gotten those looks. You know those looks. That look of disdain, that scowl from that coworker that thinks of you as being the ignorant fool because you believe in the Bible. Well, the question is, what's so great about the Bible? And this study is going to help you answer that. Over the next number of weeks, we're going to be looking at the reliability of the Scripture, the evidence of the authenticity of the Bible. And we're going to ask about what versions are best to use. This morning, we're going to talk about reasons why the Bible is so great. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 and following, we read this. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them. And from childhood you have known the holy scriptures. That word is heragramata. And that means the Old Testament books. Paul tells Timothy, you were able to be saved by reading the holy scriptures. And he goes on. And he says, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. In verse 16, it says all scripture. That is the word graphe. And it speaks not only of the Old Testament scriptures, but of the new writings that were beginning to emerge as well. So Paul speaks about those. And he says all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. The Bible claims of itself that it is inspired by God. What does inspired mean? Well, we have the word perspire, which means to sweat. We have the word expire, which means to breathe out your last breath. That's when somebody dies. But the word to inspire is the, the word in Greek is God breathed. And the Bible says of itself that it is God's word breathed through the instrument of man and written down for our reading. And so as we look at this study, what's so great about the Bible, we want to prepare ourselves to give a defense. As Peter tells us in 1 Peter 3.15, always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks. And so as we study the reasons why the Bible is authentic, we have seven of them. We're not going to get to all of them this morning, but very briefly, I will go over them and we're going to cover the first three this morning. Reasons why the Bible is so great. Well, there's the harmony of the Bible. Secondly, there's the reliability of the Bible. Thirdly, there's the scientific insights of the Bible. Fourthly, the historical accuracy. Fifthly, the prophecy. Sixthly, its message, and seventhly, its power. This morning, we're going to cover the harmony, the reliability, and the scientific insights that prove to us that the Bible is not just the writings of man, but God's word breathed out through the instrument of man and written for us. Let's ask the Lord to bless us as we get into this study. Father in heaven, we want to ask you today, what is so great about the Bible? It's not that we question that, Lord, but we, we need tools and we need equipment, Lord. We need answers for those people that we come across in our daily life. And so teach us now, Lord. Equip our minds to be able to understand and comprehend what you would have us to do so. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I moved a piano the other day. It uh, was given to us by a woman who whose daughter quit piano lessons. She was in high school and the piano teacher told her, you need to quit piano. Could you believe it? And so she quit piano and there was this upright piano in her apartment on the second floor and she said, we want to get this out of our house. And so our children's piano teacher called us and said, hey, do you want a piano? We said, all right. And what does it cost? Nothing. It costs nothing? Okay, then of course we want it. And so I went over to the house with Ben and we moved the piano. We got it out of the house and we got it down the stairs. It should have been a 12-man job, but Ben and I took care of it. We got it down into the truck and we got it to the house. And as we rounded the corners, bits of the piano would fall off and sawdust was flying. And that poor thing got beat up. Let me just say that the piano is a little more well-rounded than it was before. But that's all right. It's not a Steinway. It still works. 
But we're told that after you move a piano, you have to have it retuned. No doubt. You have to have it retuned because with all that banging, that piano will go out of tune. And if you play it, it won't sound good. And so now we, of course, brought the tuner in and he spent an hour plunking and plinking and and he finally got this thing in tune. And now our house is filled with beautiful music. Well, not really. (laughs) The piano's in tune nonetheless. And as I think about that piano, I realize that it's really only good if it's in harmony with itself. Nobody wants to hear a piano out of tune. It's dissonance. It just drives you crazy. Well, the Bible is like a piano that has been moved time and time again. It has been through wars. It has been through fires. It has been through storms. It's been attacked and jostled time and time again. But miraculously, over all that time, it has remained in perfect tune. The first reason why the Bible is so great is because it is in harmony with itself. Most of us were raised in an educational system or a climate where the Bible is not even on the radar. You know what I mean? I mean, our schools will either skip over the Bible as a historical literary work or they will mock it as a symbol of ignorance or superstition. We really live in a society where paganism is enforced. We live in an enforced paganism that keeps our minds in the dark. And so it is our job as Christians to educate ourselves on the word of God. Now, let me just say that 45 minutes on a Sunday morning is not really going to do the job thoroughly. You have to go and educate yourself. But this study will give us a start. It will give us a go. And so you've heard of that phrase as we begin now to speak about the scripture, the canon of scripture. I always get in my mind a a big canon. I wish that that's what it was. Sometimes it would be nice to have a canon of scripture. You could blast away. But the word canon of scripture really just means the measurement. The word canon comes from a Greek word, which means a cane. It's a reed. It's a it's like a ruler, a measuring stick. And so when somebody speaks of the canonicity or the the canon of Scripture, what they're saying is that these are the books of the Bible which measure up to what is considered to be God's word. Well, what is in the canon of Scripture? What measures up? Well, we have 66 books in the Bible, 39 in the Old Testament and 27 in the New Testament. The Old Testament is very easy to break up in our minds at 17, 5, 17. 17 books that are historical, five books that are poetical, and 17 more books that are prophetical. Very interesting. From Genesis to Esther, 17 books that are all about history. And then you have five books. You have Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. These are books of poetry. And then, of course, you have the prophets from Isaiah to Malachi, 17, 5, 17. Of course, in all, there's 39 books. The Old Testament in the Hebrew Bible is completely the same, although they break it up a little differently. They have 24 books. Well, how do they do that? Well, they combine 12 prophets into one book. They take six historical books and they put them all into one. How do they divide their scriptures up? Well, you wouldn't find the Hebrew Bible in the same order as our English Bible. They divide their scriptures up in the Old Testament in three ways. They have the law, they have the prophets, and they have the writings. They just call them the writings. The law is the Torah, the books of Moses, the first five, the Pentateuch. The law, the prophets, the Nevi'im they called them, and the writings, the history, the poetry, the Psalms, and so forth. Those are the Ketuvim. You actually see this in Luke chapter 24, verse 44, when Jesus resurrected and he appeared to the disciples and he said to them, these are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law, number one, in the prophets, the Nevi'im, number two, and in the Psalms, the Ketuvim, the writings. And so we have all the content in the Old Testament the same. Well, what about the New Testament? The New Testament is made up of 27 books. The first four, actually the first five are historic. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and then Acts are basically a historic reference to what happened. It's the story of Jesus. It's the beginning, the birth of the new church. Then after that, you have 21 letters. These are called epistles. What's an epistle? 
Well, it's a letter written by an apostle. I don't know where the word epistle came from, but it's an older word. It's just a letter. Most of them were written by the apostle Paul. And then some by, by John and James and Peter also wrote a couple. And so you have 21 epistles followed by the last book of the Bible, Revelation. One prophetic book. Now, less than a hundred years after the time of Christ's resurrection, most of these books were considered by the early church to be canonical. They were considered to be God's word. Now, the church didn't say, we considered these to be God's word, therefore they are God's word. They said, these measure up to the standard, we are recognizing them as God's word. They weren't making them God's word, they were recognizing them as God's word. And so, by the end of the first, or the second century rather, the entire Bible was canonical. It was finished. The books were closed. All 66 books of the Bible were there, and they were ready. In the New Testament, they were already considering, are these really Scripture? Well, of course, Paul spoke to the the people of Thessalonica, and he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of man, but as the word of God. See, the apostles knew that what they were writing was actually being God-breathed, that they were writing out the very Scriptures of God. Remember when Peter was talking, turn over to 2 Peter chapter 3. Peter refers to the writings of Paul the Apostle as being very Scripture. And he says in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 15, Consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you. Also, in all his epistles, speaking of them, in them rather, of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction. They do this also to the rest of scriptures. And so Peter says that the writings of Paul were scripture on par with the Old Testament. Now, as far as history goes, A hundred years after the resurrection of Jesus, the New Testament was formulated and Scripture. As a matter of fact, there's an interesting fellow by the name of Ignatius. Ignatius lived to about 110 A.D. And in one of his writings, there are about eight letters, and he quotes 18 different books of the New Testament even before the end of the first century. And so at that time, church fathers were writing back and forth, and in them they were quoting the letters of Paul, of Peter, of John as Scripture. So we have the harmony of Scriptures. You have 66 different books written by 40 different authors. These men had different backgrounds. They were soldiers. They were civil leaders. They were fishermen. They were farmers. There were shepherds. There was even a doctor. They had different levels of education. They were from every strata of society. They wrote on three different continents in three different languages over a period of 1,500 years. They touch on controversial subjects in the Bible such as the existence of God, the origins of the universe, the nature of man, and the reality of evil. You'd think with such a diversity of authors and backgrounds and languages and subjects, the Bible would be completely incoherent. I mean, try that today. Take 20 people, divide them up over, say, 150 years, have them write in three different languages on controversial subjects like law and government and morality and the role of men and women in society, and see what they come up with. See what kind of harmony there would be. It would be a complete disaster. Is that what you find in the Bible, however? No. As the Bible is written over 1,500 years, 40 different authors, different backgrounds, different levels of society, different languages on controversial subjects, what you have in your hand in the Bible is one singular theme unfolding the drama of God's love for mankind. It is a unified, clear message. It is absolutely amazing. It has remained in perfect harmony over all of the years that the Bible has been attacked. I mean, really, no book has been attacked like the Bible has been attacked. Has Shakespeare been attacked like the Bible? Absolutely not. Has Seneca? Has Plato? Has Aristotle? No. But the Bible has been through battles, through wars. It was said by Bernard Ram, no other book has been so chopped, knived, sifted, scrutinized, and vilified. 
What book on philosophy or religion or psychology of classical or modern times has been subject to such a mass attack as the Bible? With such venom and skepticism, with such thoroughness and erudition, upon every chapter, line, and text, the Bible is still loved by millions, read by millions, and studied by millions. And so the first reason the Bible is so great is because it is in perfect harmony. There's no other book like it in the world. Forty different authors, 66 different books written over 1,500 years in three languages on three continents with one singular, united, coherent message about God's love for mankind and the need for man to be forgiven of his sin and redeemed. Why is the Bible so great? Because the harmony proves it is indeed God's word. Secondly, the reliability of the Bible is proof that the Bible is not just a work of man, but the word of God. You know, most criticism, I think, about the Bible today is not really about what the Bible says, but about if the Bible said it. Have you noticed that? People don't want to talk about what the Bible says. They just want to debate whether the Bible even said it. It's no surprise that the first four words out of Satan's mouth recorded in the scriptures are these. Has God indeed said? His tact has been the same from the very beginning. Did God really say that? All Satan wants to do is attach in the minds of people in the world a question mark over the word of God. It doesn't matter if they talk about content or not. All he wants to do is overlay the pages of Scripture with a giant question mark. He still does the same thing. Is the Bible really God's word? I don't think so. Many people will say. Paul told Timothy that this would be the hallmark of the last days. Turn over to 2 Timothy chapter 4. Paul speaks about the peril of the last days in chapter 3, and then he continues in chapter 4. In the last days, perilous times will come. Chapter 4, verse 3 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, these last days. But according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth, and be turned aside to fables. Later, Paul would tell Timothy, you preach the word because the word has power. Not man's opinion, not fables, not opinions, not different stories and allegories, but the word of God has power. But in the last days, people will depart from the word of God. They will turn their ears away. And so before we even ask about the content of the Bible, we have to ask about the reliability of the Scriptures. Before asking if it is the Word of God, we have to ask, as with any other document, this very important question, has it been transmitted to us accurately? The Bible that we have now, is it the way that it was written? That's a very important question. Do we have the originals? And if we don't, do we have copies? And how many copies do we have? And can we compare them? I mean, how reliable is the Bible, just say, as literature? Charles Dickens said, the New Testament is the very best book that ever was or ever will be known in the world. Now, today, students might study Dickens as they study literature. As they study classical literature, they might study Aristotle, Shakespeare, Homer, or Seneca. But the Bible is many times left out just as literature. Why is that? Does the Bible not stand up to the test like the rest of these classics? No. The Bible is actually the very most reliable ancient document mankind has ever had or will ever have. Let me prove that. The scripture was given first as it came to Moses. It was transmitted from Moses to Joshua from Mount Sinai, from Joshua to the elders. The elders in Israel gave it to the prophets who then transmitted that to the priests and the scribes. These were people that spent their lives copying and recopying manuscripts. You know, back then they didn't have cut and paste. They had to write every single letter and these men gave their lives to it. They would take the scrolls and they would copy them. There was a group of men known as the Sopharim. These were the guys who, they, of course, the Hebrew alphabet has a, a numeric value to each letter. And so they would begin copying a scroll and they would go letter by letter. If they saw an error in the original that they were copying, 
they would repeat that error with a note in the margin so that they would be identical. They took no liberties whatsoever with the transmission of the text. In the end, the original had a numeric value based on the addition of all the Hebrew letters in it. And you would have thousands and thousands of these letters. They would take the copy and they would add those letters up as well. If the sum wasn't identical to the original, they would discard that and start all over again. And so they were very meticulous in the way that they copied these. How many copies of the Old Testament do we have? We have about 14,000 of them. This doesn't include the the Septuagint. The Septuagint was a Greek copy made in Egypt at around 285 B.C. And so... The interesting thing about modern days is you look at the Old Testament and you say, well, how reliable is it? You know, the Masoretes lived around 1,000 A.D., about 1,000 years after Christ. And these were the, the Jewish men that really paid attention to the Old Testament. And they wrote things and they were copious in their notes and they wrote down all of the things in the Old Testament. And really, the oldest version of the entire Old Testament was dated at 1000 A.D. It was a thousand years old from now. The problem that many people had with this was they said, well, this is 1400 years after the close of the Old Testament. You know, the Old Testament was finished 400 B.C. Before the years of Christ, the Old Testament was done at 400 B.C. Now, the oldest manuscript that we had was at a thousand B.C. Well, the critics would say, well, after 1400 years, Surely there must be so many mistakes after all of those copies and copies. Those scribes couldn't have been so detail-oriented as to get everything right. And so they continued to criticize the Bible until 1947. What happened in 1947? Well, that was the year that the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. That was an amazing archaeological discovery. The Dead Sea Scrolls are found at the northern end of the Dead Sea. There was a shepherd boy looking for his sheep, and the sheep would wander into the caves where it was cooler. And so he spent time throwing rocks into the caves right around the area of Qumran. And as he threw rocks into the caves, hoping to scare his sheep out, one stone, as he threw it in, made a peculiar sound. It was the sound of clay breaking. It was the shattering of a pot. And so he investigated and he found numerous clay pots that were two feet high and and they were about 10 inches round in diameter at the top. And each one of these clay pots were leather manuscripts covered in linen cloths. This was the library of a group of people that lived in the area 2,000 years ago. The Essenes lived in that area of the Dead Sea around 100 B.C. to the period of 68 A.D. after Christ. See, the Romans persecuted them, and of course they fled, but as they fled in 68 A.D., they stashed their library in the caves. And for 1,900 years, their library, these Jewish scholars, were preserved in these caves untouched. And what was in the library? The Old Testament. Every book of the Old Testament was found in those scrolls or portions thereof. It was the most monumental archaeological find in that sense, because what did it do? It said that here we have the oldest manuscripts a thousand years old, but now new manuscripts have been found that are two thousand years old. Now we can compare what we have in our Bible with what they had prior to the time of Christ. One copy of the the scroll of Isaiah was of particular interest because they found that it was virtually identical to the manuscript of 1000 A.D. What did that show? It showed that the Bible had been transmitted exactly. Jesus said not one jot or tittle. A yod in Hebrew is the smallest mark in the Hebrew alphabet. Not one yod or tittle. That's the little hook that decorates the consonants will pass from the law. And so it was true that the law was preserved. The Old Testament was preserved. Finally, the the criticism ended. They stopped complaining. It proved conclusively that not only the book of Isaiah, but the entire Bible was transmitted and preserved exactly as it was written, as it was in the days of Jesus and as it was in the days of the Old Testament. Now, what about the New Testament? The New Testament is a little different. After the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., All the manuscripts, all the scriptures that they had were taken away. And the center of Christianity became known in in the city of Antioch. Anybody remember Antioch? Antioch was the Apostle Paul's church. 
That's where he taught when he wasn't out on the road doing missionary journeys. We read in Acts chapter 11, verse 26, that the believers were first called Christians in the city of Antioch. Well, by 150 A.D., most of the New Testament had been compiled there in Antioch, and they had begun to make copies. They had begun to make copies from the originals. Greek copies were made, as well as copies into a language known as Syriac. The church was expanding, too. God was growing the church, and missionaries were going eastward, and so they needed to take copies of the Bible of the language that people could understand. So they took the Syriac language. Thousands of copies were made, and they were taken eastward into Persia, India, even as far as China. Pretty soon, missionaries wanted to go northward and westward. The Roman Empire, much of the Roman Empire, spoke Italian. Greece, Italy, uh, Britain, Europe, Galatia needed to be reached as well. So they translated these original Greek copies into Latin. It's known as the Itala. That was done in 157 A.D., just about 100 years after Jesus Christ. And so these three languages, Greek, Latin, and Syriac, would reach the world for centuries to come. Thousands and thousands and thousands of copies were made from the very original scriptures. As Paul wrote them, as John wrote them, as James wrote them, these were the, the copies of the originals. We don't have any originals. Uh, hardly any ancient manuscript has any of the originals. But these were the copies, and today we have close to 6,000 of them. Now, here's the question. When you have to deal with ancient literature, there's a couple of very important questions, too, namely. First of all, when did the author originally write them to the time when the first copies began to emerge? Say I wrote a letter, and a 100 years later, of course, the original's gone. People had copies. I don't know why anybody would want to copy a letter that I wrote. But just for example... The important thing is the distance between the original and the copies, because the, the bigger the amount of time, the less sure you are that the copies are accurate, because that means copies after copies have been made. So the first thing is the distance between the original and the copies. The second thing is how many copies do you have? The more copies, the better, because the more you have, the more you can compare. Ancient literature has different writings. Of course, Plato was written in 400 B.C., when did the first copies begin to emerge? 900 A.D. So you have a gap of about 1,300 years. How many copies do we have of Plato? Seven. Okay, well, we still consider Plato to be authentic. Sophocles was written in 450 B.C. And the first copies, there are no originals, were found in 1,000 A.D. That's a gap of 1,450 years. How many copies do we have of Sophocles? 193. The second most reliable ancient manuscript is Homer. Did you study Homer in college or high school? The Iliad? I remember reading that. Well, Homer was written in 900 B.C., and the first copies that we have date back to 400 B.C. That gives a gap of 500 years. That's not long com compared with other manuscripts, but the span of time is 500 years. How many copies does Homer's Iliad have? 643. It's considered to be a very reliable document. In Plato's works, there are some 764 lines of text that are in debate. In essence, about 5% of it is in doubt. They're not sure exactly what was said. And so 5%, but still it's considered to be a reliable document. What about the Bible? I said that Homer's Iliad is the second best preserved work of antiquity. Well, what is the first best? What is the greatest preserved work of antiquity? The Bible. Because the Bible was written, the New Testament rather, from A.D. 40 to A.D. 100. When do the first copies begin to appear? 125 A.D. The time gap? 50 years. One-tenth the amount of time between Homer's writing and the copies that began to appear. How many copies do we have? Homer had 600. The Bible has ten times as many. One-tenth the span and ten times the documents, 6,000 of them. Of these 6,000 documents, there are 20,000 lines of text in the New Testament, and only 40 of them are disputed or questionable. That is one-fourth of one percent of the New Testament has any dispute whatsoever. In addition to the 6,000 copies of those Antioch documents, the Syriac, the Greek, 
and the Itala, the Latin, we have thousands of other copies. You see, the Roman Catholic Church decided that they were going to conscribe Jerome to write the Latin Vulgate. How many copies do we have of that? About 10,000. There are 2,000 Ethiopic copies. We have 4,000 Slavic copies of the New Testament. 2,500 Armenian copies. We have copies of Boharic. I don't even know what that is. But we have copies so ancient. Overall, we have about 25,000 documents of the New Testament. There's no other work like it in the world. And so why... Why in the world would you get to a college class and the professor so out of hand dismissed the Bible as a myth? It's because not that they don't like the, the messenger, they don't like the message. You see, if I see a messenger coming and I know he's bringing bad news, I might shoot the messenger. You know, they say, don't shoot the messenger. Well, what these critics have done is I know what the Bible says and I don't like it. And they just shoot the messenger out of hand. They say the Bible's not reliable. Wait a second. It is reliable. It's more reliable than any document on this planet. Did you know of the 37 plays written by Shakespeare, there are no originals? Even though it was written less than 400 years ago? In most of the plays of Shakespeare, playwright scholars have had to add entire scenes just to make it make sense. Because all we have is copies. And yet you've never seen Shakespeare criticized the way the Bible is. You've never seen scholars stand up and say, Shakespeare is a fraud. Why? Because they don't care. Who cares what Shakespeare has to say? It's entertainment. But when the Bible speaks to the heart of man, and it speaks about the sinful nature of man, and the morality of man, and the reality of hell, oh, they get up in an outroar. They hate it. Not because... They hate so much the text, but they hate what it says. You see, the messenger, the scripture, it has been transmitted accurately. It's the most accurate document in the face of the world. It's the message that they don't like. They don't like the message. What if we wiped out all 25,000 of these documents that we have? We could still reproduce the New Testament based on the letters of early Christians. Did you know that the church fathers so often quoted the letters of Paul the Apostle and of John, that you could completely reproduce the New Testament with just the quotations from them? Except for 11 verses. It gives us an insight. As I mentioned before, a man named Ignatius lived from 70 A.D. to 110. He had seven letters which were written and have survived. In those letters, he quotes from 18 different books of the New Testament. If you wrote seven letters, would you quote the Scripture 18 times? That would be a good thing to do. Well, Ignatius did it. And it gives evidence to all the different letters and documents that they considered to be part of the New Testament. The number of quotations of early Christians is so overwhelming that if every other source for the New Testament was wiped out, we could still reproduce it. A man by the name of John Burgeon lived in the 18th century. When he passed away, his library was uh, looked into and they found a set of volumes, 16 volumes long, that contained all the church father's quotations of New Testament sightings. It took 16 volumes to place all the citations of the New Testament written by the church fathers. How many New Testament citations are there by the church fathers? 86,000. 489. The Bible is so accurate, it's ridiculous. It's almost embarrassing. If you ever have a debate with anybody, don't shy down. You get in their face and say, the Bible is accurate and I can prove it to you. Don't dare for a second say that the Bible is inaccurate because that's the most ignorant statement on this planet. The Bible is solid. It's sure. Well, how do we get our Bible today? Well, with the abundance of these documents that we've mentioned from Antioch and others, we were able to bring the Bible into the English language today. From 1329 to 1384, John Wycliffe lived. He was the most eminent Oxford theologian of his day. He and his associates decided that they were going to take these manuscripts and translate them into English. The church at that time, the Roman Catholic Church, was not very happy with anybody that wanted to take the Bible out of the hands of the papacy and put it into the hands of the people. And so they couldn't get to John Wycliffe before he had done his work. He passed away peaceably. 
But when finally the Roman Catholic Church caught up with him, they dug up his bones to burn them at the stake, if you will. They were so upset that they found him and dug up his bones to burn them, to show everybody. And then, of course, they commanded that everything that he written would be burned as well. But with the invention of the printing press by Johannes Gutenberg in 1436, the Bible could now come into the hands of common people. There was no copying meticulously, slowly. There was now the printing press. And so a man by the name of William Tyndale would pick up the work of John Wycliffe He was a brilliant man. He completed his work of translating the entire Bible into English by age 33. Boy, it makes you think, doesn't it? What have I accomplished? When the Roman Catholic Church finally caught up to him, they burned him at the stake at age 42 in 1535. Meanwhile, Martin Luther was translating his Bible into German. Of course, the church burned him as well. Well, they didn't burn him, but they killed him. He was considered to be a heretic. And so finally in 1607, the King of England, he was James IV of Scotland, he was James I, the King of England, he ordered a translation of the Bible. More than 50 scholars, through prayerful committees, reviewed these 5,550 scripts, manuscripts that they had available, these manuscripts from Antioch. And over the course of four years, they put together what was heralded as the noblest monument of English prose ever written, the old King James Bible from 1611. If you have one, you see it written on the inside, a little bit of history there. And for 400 years, the Bible has been in the hands of people like you and I. Now, the Bible that we hold is accurate. It is perfectly transmitted to us. And so not only is the Bible in perfect harmony, but the Bible is reliable. The reliability of scriptures proves that God indeed inspired men to write. It's important to realize, though, that a couple of hundred years ago, in around 1800, a new movement was born. Maybe you've heard about the higher critical movement. Higher criticism was a theory of embracing the Bible. It was a new approach that was born in France. No surprise. It moved to Germany and then it moved over into England and, of course, spread. This is the idea that, of course, it was born in a time of enlightenment or renaissance where human thinking or science were in vogue. Psychology, Darwinism, secular humanism were emerging. The whole thrust of this movement was to throw God out of the minds of men. And the place to begin was with the Bible. And so with this deceptive air of impartiality and scholarship, These men approach the word of God, not fairly, but with a bias against anything supernatural, against any miracles, against any possibility of divine inspiration. And instead of taking the text as it was, as you would take any other text, any other manuscript, they projected into it their own doubt, their own hatred of things. And so they said, well, this surely couldn't have happened because I don't believe in God and I don't believe in miracles. Therefore, Genesis is a myth. The first few chapters of Genesis speak about the creation. And of course, that contradicts with our new theory of evolution and Darwin. Therefore, creation is a myth. These writings are allegorical. The Gospels are untrustworthy. The teaching of Jesus is untrustworthy. Miracles, death, resurrection. Jesus didn't exist. The fact that Jesus quotes the Old Testament proves to these men that Jesus wasn't very bright either. And so they have this completely twisted view of the Scripture. They disbelieve the Bible's credibility even before they get to it because they hate the underlying message. They shoot the messenger because they hate the message. It was the most dishonest approach to any piece of literature in all time. It's been said that people don't reject the Bible because it contradicts itself, but because it contradicts them. All the while, these scholars labeled themselves as scholars, these men rather, so-called scholars, labeled themselves as scholars, and anybody who didn't agree with them was considered a fool. And so if you participated, even today, if you disagree with the secular worldview and you're a professor in college, you won't get tenure, you won't be rewarded, you'll be held back, and so that was the movement of the day. If somebody came along and said, yeah, I think the Bible's all wrong too, they'd say, hey, why don't you have a deanship or a, you can have a professorship at Oxford or Harvard. And they began to hand out positions and to reward this hatred of the Scripture. All the while, picking up where the devil left off by saying the same thing. Has God indeed said? You know, if you say that today, you'll be rewarded in this world. 
but you'll pay for it dearly in the afterlife. And so professing to be wise, these men became fools. And yet, why is the Bible so great? Well, because it is perfectly in harmony with itself. And secondly, because it's completely reliable as a manuscript. Thirdly, and the last thing that we'll cover this morning, is that the Bible gives numerous scientific insights. You know, God never asks us not to use our minds. God never asks us to believe something that is unintelligible. As a matter of fact, God says, come now, let us reason together. You know, God wants you to be reasonable. He wants you to use your brain. He doesn't want you to put your brain in a bucket and toss it out into the street and then believe God wants us to use our minds. You shall love the Lord your God with your whole mind. Use your brain. I mean, the Bible of all religions is the one that that demands that its followers use their heads. And what a message that needs to be repeated in our day and age. Use your brains. God's Word is reasonable, and it never shies away. God is not afraid of a skeptic, if he's an honest skeptic. God is not afraid of a debate. God is not afraid of a critic, if they're an honest, open-minded critic. Sir Isaac Newton, that great scientist, said, there are more sure marks of authenticity in the Bible than in any profane history. I have a fundamental belief in the Bible as the Word of God, written by men who were inspired. I study the Bible daily. Be careful of scientism. The Bible doesn't contradict science, but there are some people who are so biased against anything supernatural that no amount of evidence will ever convince them. Some people cling to science like some cognitive idol, hoping that it will free them from the moral implications of the Bible. But no matter what is observed in nature, they cannot conclude that God had a hand in it. You see, science is the observation of the natural world. And the Bible is related to that because God created the natural world. They refuse to accept any possibility of miracles or supernatural. These are what Paul warned Timothy about. Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 20, O oh, Timothy, avoid the idle babblings and contradictions of science falsely so-called. So-called science. I think it's called science fiction nowadays. Somebody might say, well, I don't believe the Bible. I believe in science. As if to imply that the Bible is either not scientific or it actually contradicts science. Well, it's true that the Bible is not a science book. If we needed a science book, God could have provided a science book for us. This is not a science book. But where the Bible speaks about science, it is accurate. It is accurate. The Bible teaches that God made the natural world, and if this is indeed God's word, God is not going to contradict the natural world that he made. If the Bible is God's word, wouldn't it have some scientific insight? Yes, it does. And I'm glad you asked, because I'm about to tell you. The Bible has so many things about modern science that we know today, but were revealed in the Old Testament that were unheard of. Of course, you know that George Washington was sick, and the medicine in those days was to bleed somebody. They would use leeches. And so there as George Washington lay on his deathbed, and they put those little black leeches to suck his blood out. Why did they do that? Well, they believed that death was in the blood. But in his bureau, just next to his bed, there was a Bible that if they would have opened it up, it would have said, the life is in the blood. See, the Bible has said the life was in the blood long before mankind understood the role of the blood in the circulatory system or the fact that it carries oxygen to the muscles. Without your blood, you can't live. And so they foolishly bled George Washington to death. He would have been healed. He lost strength and died with a Bible just at his side. When Israel left Egypt, God would give them a new and a a radical approach to holding their society. God would give some of the most common sense things to you and I, because we understand nowadays. But when God told the people of Israel, when you have to go to the bathroom, go outside the camp and take a little shovel with you and bury it. And you say, well, yeah, good thing. I don't want to go on a camp out where people aren't going outside the camp. And you'd say, well, it's obvious, isn't it? But did you know that the Egyptians who were considered to be the wisest people in the world of that day, Their scientists and their doctors believed that you could use fecal matter as an ointment over open wounds. That was the knowledge of the day. 
And so how in the world did God show the people of Israel the right thing to do? He says, just go outside. And he doesn't spend a lot of time explaining it to them. He just says, I am the Lord. Just listen to me. It's funny because the Lord says, I am walking in the midst of the camp. He says, don't be going out in the middle. I'm walking around out there. Come on, guys. But God just makes it very clear. But see, that, it seems so rudimentary to us today, but that was a groundbreaking, earth-shattering thing for them to be simply hygienic. There was a man by the name of Ignaz Semmelweis. He was a doctor in the maternity ward of Vienna Hospital in the 1800s. Birth mothers were uh, experiencing a high mortality rate. They would come in to have children and the birth mothers would often pass away. It was very sad and Semmelweis wanted to stop it. He noticed that there were two groups of people attending the births. There were the nursing students and there were the midwives. The nursing students would come straight from their autopsies on cadavers. And then they would go without washing because in the 1800s they didn't have any clue about being unclean. And they would go directly into the birthing room and they would attend the birth. And the birth mother would often become infected. She would uh, get sick and she would pass away. Semmelweis observing this and he observed also that the midwives were not touching cadavers just before the birthing process. And so he began to institute something that he was mocked for. What was that? Wash your hands. He said to every doctor and every nurse that was going to be in the birthing room, you wash your hands thoroughly. You don't come from the cadaver table to the birthing table without washing your hands. He was criticized. He said, you're crazy. But you know, the Bible said 2,500 years earlier, don't touch a dead body or you'll be unclean. He followed that advice. And the result, of course, you know that the mortality rate dropped so radically that it became a practice overall. The scripture speaks about physics as well. It's very poetic, but Job speaks about light being in constant motion. In Job chapter 38, verse 19, he says, where is the way, the path of light? Scientists didn't know that light traveled or had a path. Job also speaks that air had a mass. The fact that air has weight was proven scientifically only 300 years ago. And yet Job said in Job 28, 25, to establish a weight for the wind. Job speaks in chapter 26, verse 7, about the earth hanging on nothing. Job speaks poetically of the fact that the globe itself was suspended on nothing. Now keep in mind that this came at a time that every ancient religious work had absurd statements about the natural world. Hindu writings say that the earth is held up on the back of four elephants that stand on the back of a giant sea turtle that's swimming in the milk. But the Bible says that God hangs the earth on nothing. Isaiah said in chapter 40, verse 22, it is he who sits above the circle of the earth, the sphere of the earth. No biblical Christian was ever a flat earther. The Bible said long ago that the earth was a globe. Isaiah, Job, Jeremiah, Ecclesiastes all describe precipitation, evaporation, the jet stream and the hydrological cycle thousands of years before science even understood them. Jonah speaks about the mountains in the bottom of the sea. How could Jonah speak about the mountains at the bottom of the sea? Nobody knew about the mountains that were in the sea until we had to know about them because we had submarines down there. Well, Jonah was on a different kind of submarine and he knew about the mountains of the sea. Either these guys were extremely lucky or they were smarter than the rest of the world or they were simply inspired by God to write things before the world of science has discovered it. Somebody once said that as scientists struggle to reach the peak of knowledge and they climb up that mountain, they finally pull themselves over the last ledge and they see a group of theologians sitting around and they say, what took you so long? Science is catching up with what the Bible has had to say. The scientific statements made centuries before prove that the Word of God is the Bible, or the Bible is God's Word, rather. In conclusion... 
It's been said that the Bible is like a telescope. If I look at a telescope, I only see a telescope. But if I look through a telescope, I see other worlds. And so it's the same with the Bible. I can sit and I can look at it sitting on my coffee table or on my desk and I'll just see a Bible. But if I begin to look through it, I'll begin to see the world to come. I'll begin to see spiritual things. You've got to feed yourself the Word of God. One of my desires through this series is not so much that you'll have an answer for the people that challenge you, but that you'll have a renewed excitement about the Word of God. I want you to take church home with you every Sunday. Have church yourself on Monday. Nobody ever sat in front of a refrigerator thinking that a burrito would magically appear and feed them. You feed yourself. Feed yourself. Eat the Word of God. Study to show yourself approved. Study. Get into the Bible. Have a hunger. Have a passion for God's Word. You have to feed yourself. You have to not only look at it, but you've got to look through it. George Mueller, who was, of course, known for his incredible faith. He was an amazing man. He says, the first three years after my conversion, I neglected the Word of God. But since I began to search it diligently, the blessing has been wonderful. I have read the Bible through 100 times and always with increasing delight. You've heard about David Livingston as he got to Africa. He had 73 books, big books, in three different packs. They weighed 180 pounds. After 300 miles of hiking, he began to toss out some of those books. And under the hot African scorching sun, he went on and he continued to throw out book after book until he had one book left. That's right, the Bible. He had the Bible. Patrick Henry said the Bible is worth all other books which have ever been printed. Of course, you know about John Bunyan who wrote The Pilgrim's Progress. He testified, I was never out of my Bible. He gives us a word of encouragement. He says, read the Bible and read it again. Don't worry if you don't understand or if you don't have commentaries. Pray and read and read and pray. For a little from God is better than a great deal from man. Oh, read your Bibles. Read your Bible. Maybe you've seen this little spam email that goes around. It's called, I wonder what would happen if we treated our Bible like we treat our cell phones. What if we carried it around in our purses or our pockets? What if we turned back to the house to get it if we forgot it? What if we flipped through it several times a day? What if we used it to receive messages? What if we treated it like we couldn't live without it? What if we gave it as a gift? What if we used it as we traveled? What if we used it in case of emergency? What if we upgraded it to get the latest version? Think about it. Treat your Bible like it's the most important thing in the world. Because it is. God's given it to us for our strengthening. The Word of God is inspired. The Old and New Testaments for our encouragement. Father, thank You that Your Word is true. We thank You, Lord, that You tell us through the prophet Jeremiah, My Word is like a fire. My word is like a hammer that breaks and shatters the rock. We thank you, Lord, that it's been said that the word of God is like an anvil that has worn out many hammers. Lord, your word is sure. It's something to build upon. Lord, your word is powerful. It's something to use. And so, Lord, strengthen us as we look back over the course of history and we see your faithfulness to present to us the most important message of all time, your love letter to us, the word of God. Encourage our hearts, Lord, as we go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are in a series that we've called, What's So Great About the Bible? What is so great about the Bible? Well, my answer is everything. Everything is great about the Bible. And this morning we're going to get into our second part, What's So Great About the Bible? Part 2. We've got a number of points that we've covered last week. But this week we want to discuss a couple of things regarding the Bible and history and the Bible and prophecy. There's an interesting story in Jeremiah chapter 36. You don't have to turn there, but uh, the whole chapter speaks about an account of the prophet of the Lord. Jeremiah was a prophet, and God had given him his words. God had inspired him 
to speak. And the words that Jeremiah spoke were literally the words of God. As a matter of fact, Peter tells us in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, that no prophecy ever came by the will of man, but rather holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. And so the scripture says of itself that it was recorded as God spoke or breathed through, Paul would tell Timothy, that all scripture is inspired of God. God breathed and is profitable. And so there the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 36 would speak the words of God and he had a scribe who would record these words. The scribe's name was Baruch. And Baruch recorded the words and they wrote them on a scroll. And of course, Jeremiah, being a prophet, he was no friend of the king and he was arrested. He was on house arrest, so he couldn't go to the temple. And so he said to Baruch, Baruch, you take that scroll up and read it in the temple and see what the people think. Well, Baruch did. And the people were amazed and they said, we have got to read this in the presence of the king. And so they took it to the king. The king's name was Jehoiakim. The king didn't like it. And they began to read it before the king and he was sitting, it was in the winter months, in his palace and next to him was the fireplace. And as the reading of the scripture began, he listened to three or four columns of it and then he pulled out a knife and he slashed that scroll and he threw it into the fire and burned it. And that was a, a powerful gesture against the Lord. I mean, scrolls, you couldn't buy them uh, here and there. These were the arduous work of of people that would write them over and over. And so, not liking what the prophet had to say, he burned the scroll. What did the scroll say? Well, the scroll recorded the past, and it spoke of the future. It recorded the past because the nation of Israel had sinned. And it recorded the future because it said that the Babylonians were going to come and, of course, conquer the city. Jehoiakim didn't like that. And people don't like it when the Bible talks about their past and it talks about their future. And so the scripture has been under attack from the very beginning. People have tried to slash at it. They've tried to burn it. They've tried to cut it up, hack away, chop it down, to throw it in the fire, if you will. And we mentioned last week that the open assault on the Bible began about 200 years ago. There's always been a, an attack on the Bible. But 200 years ago, a movement known as higher criticism emerged in France, it moved to Germany, and it came to England where it said that the Scripture was completely untrustworthy. Based on what evidence? Well, based on these pseudo-scholars. And so this movement seeped into the culture and it's gone so far as to come into the very church. As a matter of fact, a survey was done of 10,000 clergy in the United States. And they were asked if they believed the Bible was the inspired, inherent Word of God in faith, in history, and in secular matters, it was accurate. And of the American Baptists, 67% said, no, it's not the word of God. Of the American Lutherans, 77%, these are the clergy, by the way, 77% said, no, the Bible is not the word of God. Of the clergy of the Presbyterians, 82% said, no, the Bible is not the word of God. Of Methodists, 87% said, no, the Bible is not the word of God. And the Episcopalians... 95% of their clergy say, no, the Bible is not the Word of God. But you know, it's interesting, in Psalm 138, verse 2, this is what God says. In the Psalms, it says, I will worship toward your holy temple and praise your name for your loving kindness and your truth. For you have magnified your Word above your name. That's an interesting scripture, because what it says is that my view of the Word of God reflects my view of God himself. If I have a low view of his word, then I have a low view of God. I mean, let's just let's just be practical here. If the God that I believe in cannot give his scripture and preserve his scripture, then he is no God worth following. Listen carefully. If the Bible is not trustworthy, then God is not trustworthy. That is plain and simple. And if you don't believe the Bible is the Word of God, you serve a weak and false God. Either this is the Word of God, holy, preserved by God Almighty, or it is nothing. And if I begin to chip away at the Word of God, I no longer become a critic, I become God myself. And so that's why Charles Spurgeon would say, I recommend you either believe God up to the hilt or don't believe at all. 
Believe this book, every letter of it, or else reject it. There's no logical standing between the two. See, if I don't follow the Word of God, then I don't follow God. If I don't submit to the Word of God, I don't submit to God. There's no way around it. We've covered so far what's so great about the Bible was that it's harmonious in and of itself. Remember last week we talked about the fact that it was written by 40 different authors over 1,500 years on three different continents, in three different languages, on controversial subjects, and yet it's a unified, singular message of God's love for mankind. We also talked about the accuracy or the reliability of the Scripture. It's been transmitted to us in a reliable way. Of ancient literature, the Bible is the number one most reliable document that we have, a hundred times better than the second most reliable, Homer's Iliad. It's even more accurate than anything Shakespeare wrote, and he only wrote less than 400 years ago. And then we touched on the unique scientific aspects that the Bible mentioned. Even though the Bible is not a science book, many things are mentioned in the Scripture far before the time they were discovered by science. The Bible talks about the velocity and the speed of light. It speaks of the earth as a globe hanging on nothing. Amazing insights hundreds and hundreds of years before they were discovered by science. And today we want to look at the next couple of things. First of all, the historical accuracy and the prophecy of the Scriptures. That is, that the Bible looks back in time and it looks forward in time. What's so great about the Bible? Well, it's historically accurate. One of the biggest arguments that you will find on any college campus or among any critics today, even within the church, is that the Bible is not historically accurate. The critics will say, well, the Bible's been changed so many times, you really can't trust it. It's been changed. It's not factual about historical events. You know, the critics for years said that the book of Genesis couldn't have been written by Moses. Why was that? Well, they said Moses didn't have writing. They didn't have writing back in that time. 2500 B.C., writing didn't exist. As a matter of fact, they looked at Genesis and they went through and they said, none of these things really happen. You see, they don't want to believe in any of the historical aspects because then it means that if it's historically accurate, then the things about creation might also be accurate and then they're responsible to a God instead of Darwin. And so they said, most of the things in Genesis never took place. Over in Genesis 14, there are numerous kings listed. There's nine different kings listed. Genesis 14, what happens there? That's the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. A lot of people don't like that story. And so they said, well, we don't have any records of these kings. Moses couldn't have written it because Moses couldn't write. And Sodom and Gomorrah aren't even mentioned in secular literature. Therefore, it must not exist. And then in 1964, a city in northern Syria was excavated. The city was known as Ebla. Ebla dated back to 2500 BC, that time when they said writing didn't exist. What did they find? They found 20,000 clay tablets all with writing on them. Oops, they were wrong about Moses not having writing. And what else was written on these Ebla tablets? Well, the names of the kings in Genesis chapter 14 were written, and on other tablets, the names of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. They were wrong. The Bible also talks about the Hittites in 50 different places in the Old Testament. Now, the Bible critics would come and they would say, well, the Hittites didn't exist. We don't know anything about them. The Bible is the only place in all of our literature, in all of our archaeology, that we have any mention of the Hittites. And since the Bible is the only place that mentions it, it must not be true. So they said the Bible's wrong. There were no Hittites. And then they continued digging and archaeology would catch up with the Bible. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, archaeologists in Turkey discovered a city which proved to be the capital of the Hittite Empire. In this city, they found about 17,000 tablets all written in an Indo-European language which proved to be the language of the Hittites. Bible scholar Donald Wiseman records that gradually, over time, the visible remains of antiquity recorded until today, until now 25,000 biblical sites have been discovered by archaeology. The critics of the Bible have said that things haven't existed. New Testament towns, cities like Bethlehem, Cana, Nazareth, Capernaum, and Chorazin. They said they never existed, and then they dug them up. In several places in the New Testament, we read about places like the Pool of Bethesda, Jacob's Well. We read about uh, the Pool of Siloam and different ancient cities. The critics said it couldn't exist. 
And then some archaeologist with a little spade and a little dustpan and a little broom begins to uncover things. And lo and behold, I've been to these places. Chorazin, Bethsaida, Cana, Bethlehem. We've been there. They existed. See, the critics have been wrong time and time again. There's an interesting story in the Old Testament in the book of Isaiah about King Hezekiah. Remember when the Assyrians were coming against King Hezekiah and Hezekiah was a good king. He loved the Lord and he knew that he had to cry out to the Lord. And so he prayed that God would protect them from the Syrians. And remember that the Bible records that in one night God struck the army of the, the Assyrians. And how many thousand died? 185,000 Assyrians died. That's a noteworthy miracle. It would be something that would be worthy of noting in other sources. Do we have any other records of this? Most critics of the Bible would say, well, this never happened. It's an exaggeration. God couldn't do such a thing. We don't even believe God exists. This is all fiction. It's all legendary. It didn't really happen. But then, of course, there was a man by the name of Herodotus. He was a Greek historian in the 5th century. Cicero called Herodotus the father of history. I don't know how true that is, but he was a good historian. He basically recorded the wars between Persia and Greece. But Herodotus also included in his writings some ancient history. And he writes about the time when the Assyrian army was marching against Jerusalem. And in his history, Herodotus writes this. Field mice invaded the Assyrian camp and gnawed the quivers, bowstrings, and leather shield handles, thus disarming the military force. As a consequence, many of the soldiers were killed and others fled. And so the secular sources record that during the campaign of the Assyrians under the king, Sennacherib, huge hordes of field mice came and attacked their camp. Now, why does nobody criticize Herodotus and say, this is fictional, legendary? Well, Herodotus doesn't speak on moral issues as well. But secular history records that rodents invaded the camp of the Assyrians. By the way, rodents are always synonymous in the ancient world with plague. The last thing you want is a rat crawling around your house because it brings disease. And so surely God struck the Assyrian army with disease and, as the Bible claims, 185,000 were killed. In the 1800s, when higher criticism was really on the rise, one of their main targets was Luke. Luke, because Luke records in the Gospel of Luke and in the book of Acts, which he also writes, with such great detail. By the way, if you're going to forge something, if you're going to write a legend, you want to stay away from detail. If you're going to make up a lie, now, if anybody here has ever lied, you know that you always want to remain in the shadows of vagueness. You don't want to be too clear. You don't want to be too specific. Be nebulous. Luke doesn't do any of that. Luke's writing in the Gospel of Luke and in the book of Acts is filled with names and places and political figures and historical events. And so the Bible critics looked at Luke and said, this guy is an idiot. He doesn't know anything about history. And there was a man by the name of Sir William Ramsey who hated the Bible and he hated Luke. And so he decided that he was going to conclusively prove how wrong Luke was on all his historical details. So he began a formal investigation. The first thing was found in Luke chapter 2, verse 2. Luke records that the Roman Empire had a census. This would be a recordable fact of history. But history knew nothing of such a census. The only place it was written was in Luke, chapter 2, verse 2. And so Sir William Ramsey decided to prove that Luke was a fraud. And so he began to dig. He began to investigate. And then he discovered a parchment dated 104 A.D. that was extra biblical, and it did indeed prove that there was such a census. Oops, well, we'll skip that one. Ramsey kept looking. Turn over to Acts chapter 14. In Acts chapter 14, there's an implication that geographically, the cities of Lystra and Derbe are in a Roman district of Lyconia. But another city, Iconium, was in a different district. Acts chapter 14, verses 1 through 6. Luke writes, Now it happened in Iconium that they went together to the synagogue of the Jews and so spoke that a great multitude, both of the Jews and the Greeks, believed. But the unbelieving Jews stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brethren. Therefore, they stayed there a long time, speaking boldly in the Lord. 
who was bearing witness to the word of his grace, granting signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided, and part sided with the Jews and part with the apostles. And when a violent attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews with their rulers to abuse and stone them, they became aware of it, and they fled to Lystra and Derbe, cities of Lyconia and to the surrounding region. You see, the writer Cicero records that Iconium, Lystra, and Derby were all in the Roman region of Lyconia. But here Luke records that this city Iconium was in a different district. And so for years, the historians would say, see, Luke was making it up. He wasn't very accurate. He didn't pay attention to detail. And so Sir William Ramsey wanted to prove this. But in 1910, he discovered an inscription that declared that the first century Iconium was under the authority of Fergia for 35 years, from 37 A.D. to 72 A.D. It was only during these 35 years that the city of Iconium was outside the authority of Lyconia. That is to say that the author of the book of Luke was particularly accurate in his record of the cities of those areas, and he was an eyewitness to the events. Now, many of you are saying, oh, but I finished history class in high school. I can't take this. It's very important that we study to show ourselves approved. The Scripture time and time again proves to be immaculately accurate when it speaks of historical events. And when the critics of our modern age say, well, what we know seems to contradict the Bible, well, really what they're saying is the Bible seems to contradict me. It's been said before, and I think it's true, that no man ever rejected the Bible because it contradicted itself. People reject the Bible because it contradicts them. And so Luke was right about the cities of Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe. Other evidence backed up the Bible so much so that Ramsey was a little wavering on his details. He didn't want to continue studying. Turn over to Acts chapter 17 while you're still there in verse 8 of Acts chapter 17. The higher critics and the scholars read there in Acts chapter 17 that Luke writing about the city of Thessalonica said in verse 8, and they troubled the crowd and... The rulers. You see the word rulers there? The Greek word that Luke uses is the word politarch. The word politarch was never ever used of rulers in Thessalonica. Matter of fact, it was so controversial that the critical scholars said Luke made a mistake. He made up a word to re- report the rulers of this city. See, what they didn't do is they didn't actually do their research. Because soon an archaeologist with a spade and a broom began to dig. And they began to find inscriptions. And they began to find tablets. And they began to find records. Since that time, 17 separate inscriptions have been found in Thessalonica using the word that Luke uses in Greek, politar, the ruler of the city of Thessalonica. Luke was right. Archaeology proved the critical scholars were wrong in their ignorance. For years, the critics said that Pontius Pilate didn't exist. You know, by the way, if you're going to write against the Roman Empire and uh, you're a Jew, the last thing you want to do is to be critical of the politicians of the day because your neck was on the line. And they write very specifically and very graphically of the injustice and the cruelty of the Roman leaders. One of these leaders was Pontius Pilate. And for centuries, the critics said Pontius Pilate didn't exist. We don't know anything about him in secular history. And then in 1961, just... 45 years ago, an Italian excavation in the city of Caesarea discovered a huge block of limestone that carried the inscription that said these words, Pontius Pilate, Prefect of Judea. The critics were wrong. I've been there. I've seen it. But you see, for centuries, they said the Bible is inaccurate. It speaks about history, but it's making it up. It's all legendary. I like what Nelson Gluck, a specialist in ancient literature, said, 
He says, it may be stated categorically that there are no archaeological discoveries that have ever controverted a biblical reference. William Albright said, discovery after discovery has established the accuracy of innumerable details and brought increased recognition of the value of the Bible as a source of history. Remember Sir William Ramsey? He set about to prove that Luke was wrong. What were his conclusions? Let me quote him. Luke's history, he says, is unsurpassed in respect of its trustworthiness. Luke is a historian of first rank. Not merely are his statements of fact trustworthy. This author should be placed along with the very greatest historians. The Bible is so accurate historically, impeccable. There's no other document like it in the world. Let me introduce you to a man by the name of Robert Dick Wilson. Robert Dick Wilson was an amazing man. He was born in 1856 in the time of the height of the birth of this higher critical movement. He lived some 74 years to 1930. He was an amazing man. At age 25, he graduated from seminary. He had already been reading the Bible in nine different languages. He knew that God had given him a gift. And seeing these critics throwing their bombs at the Bible and trying to destroy it, he realized that he needed to give himself completely to the study of the Old Testament. And so this was the kind of man he was. At age 25, he looked at the, the age of his ancestors before him and thought to himself, I'm probably going to live to be about 70 years old. And so I have about 45 years of my life left. And so he decided to d divide up the next 45 years of his life into three sections of 15 years. For the first, first 15 years, he was going to study ancient Semitic languages. By the way, he would study and learn 45 different ancient Semitic and non-Semitic languages from the Old Testament. Ancient languages, 45 of them. Well, for those first 15 years, he would study that. And for the next 15 years, he said he was going to give himself to the study of the Hebrew Old Testament. He studied every single consonant. By the way, he says, I've, I've looked at every consonant of the Old Testament. There's about a million and a quarter of them. I've looked at every single one of them. And then for the last 15 years of his life, he was going to write and he was going to lecture on everything that he had discovered. God gave him an extra four years to uh, give those reports. But he was an amazing man. At 25 years old, he had his whole life mapped out before him. And by the way, he wrote at the end of his life that he followed this pattern to the year by God's grace. He did exactly what he set out to do. He lived in an era of biblical criticism from self proclaimed experts. See, these men would get up and say, I'm an expert on the Bible. And they would say something that was outlandish, but they weren't doing it from their own research. See, they were quoting another scholar who was in turn quoting a different scholar and who was quoting another pseudo scholar who was quoting some guy that just hated the Bible. And so there was really no basis for anything that they said. And so he decided that when they talked about all the experts agreeing, he would be the expert. And so he was. And he gave an address entitled, What is an Expert? I can sum up the whole address for you in a couple of words. I am an expert, he would say. I've studied everything. And there's nothing wrong with the Bible. I'm going to give you a long quote here. I ask you to pay attention very closely. He says, If a man is called an expert, the first thing to be done is to establish the fact that he is such. You will have observed that the critics of the Bible who go to it in order to find fault, have the most singular way of claiming to themselves all knowledge and virtue and love of the truth. One of their favorite phrases is, all scholars agree. When a man writes a book and seeks to gain a point by saying, all scholars agree, I wish to know who the scholars are and why they agree. Where do they get their evidence to start with? I defy any man to make an attack upon the Old Testament on the ground of evidence that I cannot investigate. I can get the facts if they are linguistic. If you know any language that I do not know, I will learn it. And he did. He learned 45 of them. And he says that after he had studied the Old Testament, this is what he says, I had learned the necessary languages and set about the investigation of every consonant of the Hebrew Old Testament. There are about a million and a quarter of these, and it took me many years to achieve my task. The result of those 30 years of study, which I have given to the text, has been this. Listen carefully. I can affirm there is not a page of the Old Testament 
concerning which we need have any doubt. 